thanks, everybody. Uh, welcome to Bill. <laughs> I'm your host, Ricky Camilleri. He is an actor, a behemoth Trump critic, like all sensible people, an on-air personality, if you get that deep cut reference, and also a children's book author. Michael Ian Black's new book, I'm Sad, follows a little girl and a potato as they attempt to cheer up a sad flamingo. Everybody, please put your hands together. Because you're not paid for it, Michael Ian Black is here. Thanks. Thank you so much. The, I mean, honestly, the warmth in this room is palpable. So thank you guys so much. I, I feel it. Some of your biggest fans are in this room, I think. Yeah, I mean, if that's true, I should just fuck off right now because... Because <laughs> they're not. <laughs> um, uh, Michael, this is, what number of children's book is this for you? I think eight. Eight. How did this start? Books? Yeah, children's book. Oh. Uh, in my case, because uh, I had these, I had these kids, and yeah, I had like two of them, and they're whatever. And uh, so I was like, well, let me. I was like, I read to them every night. Let me see if I can write books that are at least as terrible as the ones I read to my children. And it turns out I can. <laughs> Uh, this one, uh, I think, coincides pretty well with um, an issue that you've taken up in the last couple of years, which is masculinity and, and sensitivity. Not that the flamingo is necessarily masculine, but it's about being able to be sad and out without inflicting any kind of pain upon others because of your sadness. Was this inspired by a lot of the conversations you've been having? Yeah, kind of. Um, I have been having conversations about masculinity and um, the way guys are, the way we're conditioned to be. And um, this book and the one that came before it called I'm Bored relate to those ideas. And the idea is essentially that men are uh, very constrained in the way we're allowed to express who we are and what we are. And part of that conversation means expanding our ideas of masculinity, expanding what it means to be a guy. Um, so the, the, the main character, and this happens to be a little girl, but it's equally applicable to boys where we have to, I, I feel like as parents, be able to, to talk to our kids and allow them to just be whatever they are. If they're sad, great. If they're bored, great. If they're worried, great. And not necessarily try to fix it for them, just try to support them. That's a really hard thing for a parent to do. Uh, I know, you know right? I am one, and it's hard. I mean, you, so it's hard. It's hard when your kid comes to you, uh, in uh, in sadness or in in some kind of grief or worry, and not feel like, oh, I have to make this better. And a lot of times, you can't make it better. You know, you can't solve people's problems for them, kid or adult. But what you can do is let them know that you're there for them. Let you know you love them. Let them know that your shoulder is there for them when they need to cry. And what I found is as a parent, one of the best things that, and they don't mean to do this, but one of the best gifts my, my kids ever gave me was approaching me in their sadness and giving me like just literally the gift of being able to hug them and support them and love them. It's a tremendous gift that they give to us as parents and particularly I think as male parents, as guys, fathers, to be able to just unabashedly show love for somebody. It's a powerful thing um, that we feel like as guys we can do with our kids, of course, but we have so few outlets for that kind of love in our lives as men. When did you find that, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a lesson that I think you learn in your first sort of long-term relationship with a, with a partner, which is that like, you know, don't act on that initial instinct to solve the problem for them. Sit and listen as long as you can and don't try to solve it unless asked for that. When did you find that that was a sort of necessary trait with children as well? Well, first of all, it took me probably 15 years into my marriage before I learned that lesson. You, you probably still learn that lesson Absolutely. quite often, right? Like, yeah. I, yeah, I mean, I, I feel like I have been an emotional idiot for most of my life. Yeah. Just dumb, you know? Same. Just doing all the dumb, wrong things. Um, but for some reason, it, for some reason, I feel like I was naturally better at it with my kids than I am with my wife. I don't know why. Um, my own dad wasn't really uh, present in my life, not because he didn't want to be, but my parents divorced early and then he died when I was young. And I didn't really know how I was gonna be a father. I just didn't know how to do it. Um, but I happen to be great at it. That, that was, I'm kind of kidding. 
Oh, okay. I didn't know. I mean, that's that's a nice thing to say if you are great I, at it. I would never say that. And my kids probably wouldn't agree with that. <laughs> this book, I mean, speaking of parenting, this book, you've dedicated this book to your mother, right? Uh-huh. Um, and uh, it, am I wrong? Did she recent, uh, recently pass away? She died uh, almost exactly a year ago, yeah. And so was this book uh, dedicated, dedicated to her in the wake of her passing? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, the book was written before she died, but then when you know, late in the process of writing a book, you're asked for your author dedications, and she had died probably two or three months after that, and so it just felt natural uh, to dedicate it to my mom and I think I say to my mom, without her, I'm sad, uh, which is true. And you and all of this book is about is that it's okay to be sad and it's okay to grieve. Yeah, and it's hard. I think it's, it, you know, when my dad died, I was 12. And I didn't know how to mourn for him. I didn't know how to grieve. I didn't know how to be sad. And I didn't know how to live with that grief. And as a consequence, I really feel like emotionally, I kind of shut down for about 30 years. Like, no joke. Like, a, like really kind of like closed inward and did not have the kind of emotional tools to just deal with everyday life. Well, that makes sense to me, not to interrupt, but I mean, I've been a fan of your work since The State, and I think of some of the great characters that you played on The State. Devoid of emotion. Devoid of emotion, (laughs) or playing someone who was very repressed and (laughs) hiding all of their emotions and would randomly talk about something that was, was, was killing them inside, and suddenly by saying it out loud, their entire life was shattered because they'd never really thought about it. Uh, yeah, funny stuff. I mean, that is funny stuff. I always loved it. (laughs) I mean, it's interesting. It makes sense that that would come from that sort a real of place. natural instinct would be coming from you. That yeah. that would be your natural comedic place. Yeah, I, I think that's right. And then when my mom died a year ago, like I just was much better able to deal with it. I was just able to process her death. A lot of it just has to do with I'm older. She was obviously older, and there's just a kind of general maturity that happens. But a lot of it, I think, had to do with having done a lot of just kind of self-reflection over the years and trying to figure out how to be myself. And uh, it, ma- it, it made her death easier to cope with. You know, one of the ways that I personally found out that your, your mother had passed prior to even seeing this book was a tweet that you put out, I think, yesterday, where you said politics is political, or sorry, theater is, po- theater is politics, or theater is political, and something else is political. And somebody wrote, I had some asshole shitbag, you know, right wing <laughs> quote unquote comedian wrote back, Your mother is political. And you were like, yeah. I said, Yeah, she was. <laughs> she, she, she was political uh, pretty much right up until she died. She was aware of the world and engaged with the world. And it was one of the great gifts that she gave me. And that's what I wrote back because uh, it's true. How often are you uh, trolled these days? Oh, all day, every day. I mean, my, my Twitter feed is, is, uh, is, is not subtle, and it isn't shy about where I stand politically. Um, and as a result of that, I get a lot, of, uh, a lot of pushback. Were you as politically engaged prior to uh, this past election, or did this past election awaken something in you? Um, I've always been engaged politically in the sense that I've always been conscious of what's going on, trying to pay attention to what's going on, uh, and an advocate for certain things, generally on the social side. Um, But this last election was certainly a turning point for me and for, I think, a lot of people. Um, Not because we dislike uh, this president as a person, although we do, and I do very much, but because he... Uh, his policies are abhorrent, and um, and when you combine that with an abhorrent uh, personality, you get uh, a country in crisis, and that's where we are. And so as a comedian, and I know this is a hilarious interview, but as a comedian... No, I like this more than a hilarious interview. This is great. <laughs> it's very hard to tweet about whatever... Uh, the KFC funny sandwich, whatever, or IHOB, or whatever. Like, it's hard to tweet about that stuff because it's not what's front of mind for me right now. Um, I wish it were. It's not. And, I, and, and so a lot of Twitter in particular has become this kind of sanctimonious, finger-wagging, political 
uh, uh, diatribes from people like myself who are comedians, and I understand how tiresome that is for people to read that stuff. It's tiresome to, to write that stuff. It's the worst. I hate myself on Twitter. But, I, but for me, Twitter, for example, is a, point, is, is a place for self-expression, and this is the shit that I'm thinking about pretty much all day, every day. I can't help it. I wish it were otherwise. Does it make it hard to go out and promote a book like I'm Sad, or does I'm Sad in some ways tie into how you feel? It's absolutely related. I mean, I don't know how many people are going to watch me on uh, Build saying, fuck Trump, and then say, oh, I got to go buy this guy's children's book. I imagine actually a fair, a fair <laughs> amount. I'm sure there's going to be parents out there who are like, I appreciate him stating his opinion, and I have these little kids too. Maybe it'll be good for them. Maybe they'll go say fuck Trump later. Maybe. I mean, the, at no point does the potato in the book say fuck Trump. But uh, A little girl, she goes off on a rant. <laughs> she's got a potty mouth on her. The book, the, 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 the emotion, I'm sad, is related to kind of what's going on. I have talked to parents. I have... Um, heard from them that kids are having anxiety. Uh, I think a lot of that anxiety is just reflected from their parents who are feeling anxiety. Um, but there is a, a there is a general I think awareness among kids about about a kind of shift in the world that maybe is uncomfortable for them, and maybe that manifests itself sometimes in sadness or anxiety or any number of ways. But I do think. However, tangentially, there is a relationship between the sentiments expressed here and the larger uh, implosion of the world. Do you have a hard time not expressing that frustration in front of your children, or do you do it and then explain to them how you're feeling? Like, Well, my kids are older now, so my kids are teenagers, and um, my kids definitely hear my frustrations and complaints, and we talk about, for example, politics at the dinner table a lot. And I, 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 I know it's gonna sound insincere, but I really try to not put my own political agenda onto my kids in the sense that I'm not saying you should believe this. When, when I hear them parroting back to me something that I have said, I question it. And I ask them, why do you think that? Why are you saying that? What, you know, I want them to be able to stand on their own two feet and understand why they believe what they believe because so many people are, were born into a set of beliefs and we never really question them. Uh, I certainly had to question my own beliefs um, coming up and I continue to and I, I, hope, I want the same thing for my kids. I hope they end up on my side of things but I don't want them to just sort of blindly follow. How would you handle if they didn't wind up? I mean, I, I, this is a question that's really just not not just for you, I, but I ask this of my, my friends all the time. I don't have kids, but I'm pretty personally pretty far left. Right. And uh, even if I was a centrist right now, I don't know how I would be able to handle my kids on the right side of things. Well, here's the thing. I mean, it would be very hard for me. Not if, if they had a MAGA hat on. I don't know how I would be able to handle it. I, 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 it would be hard for me. Not because... Um, I don't want my kids to be Republicans, for example. If they're Republicans, they're Republicans, but I want them to understand why they're Republicans and what they're supporting when they support that, that presidency. Um, are you supporting, for example, a ban on Muslims entering the country? Because that was a policy advocated by our current president. Are you supporting uh, uh, breaking uh, 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 policy agreements and treaties with our allies? Because that's something that our president is doing? Are you supporting uh, uh, separating children from their families crossing the border? Asylum seekers, are you supporting that? And if so, I want to know why. Are you supporting this kind of racist, everyday racist dog whistling and rhetoric? And if so, I want to know why. Are you supporting policies that would uh, allow the government to discriminate against lesbian and gay and transgender people? And if so, I want to know why. Geez, Dad, I just like the hat. Right, Leave me alone. exactly. <laughs> and that would be, so it would be a real problem for me. Not because of the party, but because of the policy. Yeah, yeah, that's tough. I couldn't, I couldn't imagine being able, to, being able to handle that. Yeah, that would, that would be hard for me. And, uh, and I would have to understand why. And, and they, would have to have to, they would have to defend those positions. Do you feel like this election has awakened a different version of you in terms of your comedy and your... Uh, public persona? Well, it killed my comedy, certainly. <laughs> <laughs> do you feel like, it, like, I mean, do you feel like it killed your ability to, 
I don't want to say be funny because you're still quite funny. And, you know, we just had a Wet Hot American Summer not that long ago, and you were very funny in it. I think that probably shot before the election, though. Uh, yes, we were shooting it as when the election happened. We were shooting during the election. Uh, Is so it hard to maintain being funny and the doing next, the show? The day after the election on set was not particularly funny. Yeah. Wow. There wasn't a lot of joy and laughter that day. What is it like shooting a, a, a comedy scene? I imagine something really goofy on the, the day after that election. Well, it's like anything. I mean, you do your job. Um, you know, you, you stand on your mark and you say your words and you hope that you're funny. But on the inside, you're going, oh, this could be really bad. And here we are making this stupid summer camp TV show. A very funny and stupid summer Thank you. Camp. Oh, I meant stupid as a compliment to myself. <laughs> I want to go back to the um, masculinity crisis that you have been talking about. Uh, and I want to talk about what made you start speaking out about masculinity. When, when did that begin? What was the incident or the incidents that caused it? The immediate thing that preceded this conversation, uh, and when I say this conversation, I mean an op-ed that I wrote for the New York Times, which um, has continued since then was the Parkland shootings. Um, and I have been a very vocal advocate for uh, gun control for years now, since Sandy Hook. I live next door to Sandy Hook. Uh, not, uh, not literally, my town is next door to Sandy Hook's, uh, to Newtown. And, um, and my kids were a little bit older than those kids, uh, but we're in elementary school at that time. Uh, that was the moment where things changed for me, not the election, not Parkland. That was the moment. Um, but after Parkland, I just wrote a kind of random Twitter thread making the obvious point that the people who are pulling the trigger on these shootings are boys. It's always boys. And although I advocate for gun control, and have very vocally, in a way, and as impossible as that is, in a way, that's the easy thing to do. In a way, the easy thing to do is say, well, well, let's deal with the guns. But we're not dealing with the underlying problem, and the underlying problem seems to be boys. What is going on with boys? Why are boys exclusively doing this? And when I say this, the mass shootings are the most spectacular example of the kind of violence that boys are committing. But day to day, the gun violence, for example, that goes on, that's almost always perpetrated by boys. 90% um, of violent crime is committed by boys, men. So it's a problem. There's a problem going on with guys. It's an old problem, um, but it's a, and it's a problem that has been We've tried to address before, most recently in the 90s, when gang violence was a particular concern. We tried to address it in the 70s, when feminism uh, was really moving into the forefront and men's roles in the culture were kind of being redefined. We tried to do it in the 50s, when teenage culture was rising and there was this, there was this fear of juvenile delinquency. We've tried to do it from the beginning of the Republic in various ways but it hasn't ever quite entered the mainstream conversation for a variety of reasons. And so I'm trying it again. I wonder if it's because the mainstream conversation about it, be it w whether it's about juvenile delinquency in the 50s, the, the rise of, of, the, of second wave feminism in the 70s and uh, gang violence in the 90s, were all punitive conversations. We punish you for your ju juvenile delinquency. Uh, in the 70s, it was a lot of conversations about spree killers, serial killers, and they were saying that these are this is a result of men's di the, the dynamic changing between men and women, almost putting the blame on feminism rather than on and we men still, themselves. And which is something we still do. We still, we're still constantly blaming women for the foibles of men. Right. Uh, and you see that in uh, conversations uh, by like Jordan Peterson, for example, the famous psychologist who... Don't bring up Jordan Peterson on my <laughs> stage. <laughs> no, go ahead. Who really lays a lot of blame uh, for m 
men's social pathologies at the feet of women, saying once you start getting into questions of equality, for example, you are robbing men of their archetypical role in the culture, which is to be the hero, the guy, the knight in shining armor. You're robbing him of that, um, and as a result, men don't know who they are or what they're doing. I, I just reject that argument wholeheartedly. Um, yeah, I, I would argue that the reason that this conversation, the conversation about guys, hasn't moved into the mainstream is because there is something inherent in the way we talk about masculinity which actually prevents it from being moving into uh, mainstream conversation, which is to say that men are viewed primarily as uh, a, a, as a gender apart uh, from each other. We operate as kind of independent brokers in the world. We derive our strength from our independence, from our like grit, our fortitude, our perseverance, and we are meant to be, um, we are meant to be strong in a way that does not allow for vulnerability. And because of that, when we talk about ways to work together as guys or as men and women, the, the, the instinct for men is to close ourselves off from that conversation, even though inherently, instinctively, guys all feel the same way. Guys all feel like they can't express their full selves. They can't express their full humanity. And we know there's a problem, but to admit a problem is to admit weakness, which is to betray our own masculinity. It's a real conundrum. And if they do have the space to express themselves, often they don't have the tools right. with which to do it effectively. We're not granted the tools. Um, this is a tiny tool, you know? This is a tiny way of saying, well, this is one thing you can do as a parent. I don't think there's an easy answer, by the way. I'm not saying, like, I'm going to solve this problem or anybody in this generation is going to solve this problem. I think it's a 50-year problem the way that, uh, as you said, second wave feminism has kind of taken this long for us to get to the Me Too movement, um, which I think has been a really important movement. I think this is the beginning of that conversation for men. You know, I think we'll be having this conversation 50 years from now. But it's got to start. It's got to start in a real way. Let's get some questions from our audience. Who's a question? Hey, how are you? Hi. Um, I'm very curious. Um, I know that you're anti-Trump, but I know that you're writing a children's book. Um, what are your views of this amazing thing that Donald Trump is doing at North Korea with the nuclear disarmament? Uh, the question was, what are my views on this, and you use the word amazing thing that nuclear, uh, uh, in terms of nuclear disarmament. Yes. Uh, I'll start by saying I am certainly in favor of nuclear disarmament. I am certainly in favor of North Korea disarming. I hope they do. What we've seen so far from North Korea is literally zero indication <laughs> that they will do what they're saying they're going to do. And if you think about it, you will realize it makes no sense for them to do that. It is an impossibility for them to do that because their entire regime resides on the premise that they are a nuclear power. He cannot get rid of his nuclear weapons because if he were to do so, he feels like correctly that uh, his regime would be in danger of collapse. So I think all of this is a dog and pony show. I think it's much more beneficial for Kim than it is for our nation. I don't understand what our nation is getting out of this, other than I think uh, Trump is trying to appear like a statesman. I have no problem with him going. I have no problem with him talking to Kim Jong-un. Uh, I hope something good comes from it. I guess I would not categorize it as an amazing thing that he's done. He's basically taken a plane to Singapore and shook the guy's hand, uh, which has been great for Kim. I don't know what we get out of the deal. I'm guessing that you don't think he deserves a Nobel Peace Prize either. Do I think he deserves a Nobel Peace Prize? <laughs> sure, if it makes you happy, that's fine. Like, give uh, him the Peace Prize. Do you think he deserves a Nobel Peace Prize? I do. For, for what? What did what is he what has he actually done that has furthered the cause of peace? Nah, I know, gentlemen. I know you guys are. No, 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 no. This is okay. I'm, I'm curious. Can I? Uh, I'm curious. I think, what I think what, what do you, you a, what did you see happen yesterday? I think, I think um, when you deregulate deregulate a militant crazy man. And do you mean disarm? Disarm, disarm and deregulate. Um, I think that the bridge between North and South Korea and just getting the armory away from someone that might have a trigger finger. Sure. That deserve, would be great. Do you that think would be that great. That would be happened yesterday? I, I think it's going to lead to that at, at some point. I, I hope, hope so, so too. And I hope so. But I don't think we should rush to judgment and give him the Nobel Peace Prize just yet. Oh, and by the way, 
if, for those who say Obama didn't deserve the Nobel Peace Prize, I totally agree. I think Obama totally agrees. That was nuts that they gave that to him. I think he thought it was nuts. But to then go a one for one, well, then Trump deserves one, I think is equally nuts, or maybe more nuts, because of the, because of the way he's destabilized uh, 70 years of alliances that we've had with our closest partners, uh, which has done the opposite, I would say, of bringing the world closer to peace. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Thanks for the question. Uh, next question. Hi. Hi. Uh, so you've written several uh, children's books. Uh, do you, what's your process uh, when you're thinking up the ideas? Do you have ideas already planned uh, when you're, do you have an idea for next book? And have you thought of doing a, a children's second book on Trump? Okay. Oh, I did write a book called A Child's First Book of Trump, which was a, um, it was sort of a parody of a children's book uh, geared towards adults. Uh, as it happened, a lot of parents ended up reading it to their kids um, because I think it worked as a children's book. But to answer your first question, I think the process for any creative uh, person engaged in any creative activity is probably the same. I mean, writing a children's book is no different than writing, excuse me, I have Diet Coke burps, is no different than uh, mm -hmm. writing uh, stand-up comedy, which is no different than writing a TV show, which is no different than writing a memoir. They're all of a piece. They're all using the same tools to accomplish self-expression. And I think they're probably the same as painting a painting or writing a song. I just don't do those things I wish I did. As to where ideas come from, it's, I think you know, I mean, just as a, as a human, you, they, they pop in and they pop out, and the trick is to know when they pop in how to hold on to them and how to uh, derive inspiration from them. And once you have that inspiration, you have to understand that the inspiration will fall right through your fingers like sand. That, that, that initial moment, that initial idea is important, but it's only the first step. And it's not even necessarily the most important step. The most important step is the discipline to see it through, which is an almost impossible thing to do. It so happens that for me, like writing kids' books is a fairly short process. Um, but you know, I, I write books too, and, and it's, it's an incredibly tedious, difficult, awful process. And if you have creative ambitions, I think any artist will tell you this, it's not about waiting for the muse or the inspiration to strike. It's about being there and doing the work so that when that inspiration happens, you're already there, you're already present. And when that inspiration isn't happening, you're doing the work anyway, and you're just slogging through. It's work, but it's work that hopefully is rewarding. Michael, congratulations on the book. Thanks. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Pleasure Thank talking you to you, Ricky. By. Yeah. Is the book on shelves now? People can pick it up. Oh yeah, you can go. You can run out and it. buy it at bookstores. And go get seven. The other seven too. Yeah, why not? Go get all of his books. Look, if you like a talking potato, you're gonna love this book. And follow him on Twitter. Sure. And read that to your child like it's a children's book as well. Sure. Follow my sanctimonious politicizing on Twitter at michaelianblack.com or michaelianblack. Yeah. Michaelianblack, everybody, let's hear it. <laughs>